Uh, our next speaker is Hilario Ramos, a VP and head of the immunology team at Molecular Templates in Austin, Texas. Um, he obtained his PhD at UT Southwestern Medical Center in immunology in 2009. He was a senior fellow at University of Washington and then worked at Gilead and Aptivo before coming to Molecular Templates. His group is working to deliver unique therapeutic immunotoxin-based approaches for elimination of cancers. He has over 15 years of experience as a T-cell immunologist and has spent the last 10 uh, working toward identification and development of novel immunological therapeutics for viral disease and immune oncology. In his spare time, Dr. Ramos is an avid musician and has a lifelong passion for hiking. All right, you may begin. Thank you, Emily. Um, can everybody hear me and, and see my slides? Yes, you're good. Great, yeah, thanks again, Emily, for, for the invitation, for the opportunity to be here to, um, to, to speak with everybody. It's been a great conference so far. Um, really have enjoyed many of the talks uh, today. And I think some overlap with what I'll talk about today with some of the, the, the previous two in, in terms of the checkpoint space and also thinking about antigen specific T cell responses. So um, today I'll, I'll walk through some of the work that we do in Austin, Texas at a, a company called Molecular Templates and really focusing efforts on our our platform technology, which is called Engineered Toxin Bodies, and a sort of next generation approach for harnessing um, sort of the endogenous T cell responses that are naturally occurring and maybe redirecting them um, towards cancer indications. So um, I'll kind of break it up into, into three small chunks uh, today, and that will be, um, looks like I'm one slide ahead here. Okay, here we go. Um, Three parts, talking about our engineered toxin bodies, then talking about our antigen seeding approach, and then um, talking about our lead molecule that we're moving into the clinic using this technology, MT6402, which targets PDL1. So um, engineered toxin bodies are, are really a unique approach. They take advantage of a bacterial toxin from the sugar-like uh, toxin A subunit. And this is a natural ribosome inhibitory protein. Uh, that drives um, ribosome inhibition through its ability to uh, leverage forced internalization, retrograde transport, and then engaging with the 28S ribosome to depurinate it to drive apoptotic cell death. So we've taken uh, advantage of this particular molecule and engineered it into a, a single genetically fused molecule, which has an antibody targeting fragment, usually an SCFE, which allows us to target to whatever particular target of interest in our, in our indications. In our clinical portfolio, we've, we've led with CD20 targeting CD38 and HER2 for DLBCL, multiple myeloma, and, and solid tumors. And then in our pipeline, I'll talk about our, our lead for PDL1, which uses our antigen seed technology, but we also have programs around CTLA4 and uh, CS1 for solid tumors and multiple myeloma. Uh, so as we've been building up the program, in addition to just being able to drive this really um, unique biology, uh, around the internalization of the particular uh, engineered toxin body and, and eventually cytosol delivery of the, the shiga toxin payload. You know, we think there's opportunities around this for further payload de delivery. And what jumped out to us in terms of moving into the immune oncology space was the ability to deliver antigenic peptide to these tumors in a novel way to make them now visible to the immune response and drive T cell responses that aren't necessarily tumor responses, but maybe antiviral responses against the tumor itself. So thinking about the, the sort of immune oncology in, uh, space in general, there is, you know, uh, a large uh, variety of different approaches that people are taking you know, to drive immunity against the tumor. Many of these are focused around T cell responses, not exclusively, there's lots of different approaches that people are taking. But in terms of thinking about the T cell type responses, there's sort of the set that is involved around T cell redirection. And that would be bispecific T cell engagers, CAR Ts, personalized and adoptive T cell therapies, where you're trying to really drive T cell responses to that tumor by um, modulating the T cells themselves somehow. There's ways to alter the TME um, or to restore immune responses, either through de novo expansion through vaccination or monoclonal antibody targeting of particular cell types or pathways. Um, we've heard about the checkpoint inhibitors today and blocking the PD-1, PD-L1 or CTLA-4 axes to restore dysfunctional T cell responses all with the common goal of driving anti-tumor immunity. So with our particular platform, again, we're interested in whether or not we could use our engineered toxin bodies to participate in some of these approaches where there's potential unmet need and benefit um, for, for novel modalities. And so 
we, we have a unique approach, at least with this molecule targeting PDL1, to um, you know, try and limit the tumor response by depleting tumors themselves that are expressing PDL1, uh, potential to deplete immunosuppressive cells that express high T uh, PDL1 in the tumor microenvironment. And then this novel approach of redirecting T cells by delivering um, the antigenic payload. So I want to jump in briefly just again and kind of hone in a little more on targeted T cell therapies where we're kind of starting to kind of fit this particular molecule into. And again, bispecifics and, and CAR T or adoptive uh, T cell responses have been really the primary mechanisms here. You can see a bunch of different modalities that have made significant progress in terms of patient uh, benefit across a variety of different disease indications. Um, but that being the case, still um, the majority of the effects, if we sort of measure this by approved agents, have been really around one target, CD19, uh, in, in the heme space. And so you have blincite, uh, blincitumab, discarda, chimera, and tacardis that are kind of the main drivers in this space. A ton of effort looking at new antigens and, and new particular indications. And so uh, we feel like we have the opportunity to participate with ETBs as the potential to kind of help um, move into uh, indications that may be solid tumors or other targets that, that haven't worked in the past. So can ETBs um, be used as a new modality for T-cell redirection? And I think one unique thing for us is thinking about an opportunity to do so in a way that's not modulating the T-cells themselves, but potentially modulating um, the tumor directly to drive this redirection. So I'll transition over into talking a little bit more about what this antigen seeding technology is. So if we focus in again on the engineered toxin body, again, it has the sugar-like toxin molecule, it has its binding domain, and now we've, uh, as part of this genetic fusion, added a viral class, class one antigen. So this gives us the opportunity for a single agent approach to deliver multiple mechanisms of action. Uh, the payload, the first payload being the engineered sugar toxin, which will still inhibit the ribosome activity, but this addition of a viral peptide to um, seed antigen to MHC class one to be delivered to the surface alter that surface phenotype, and now hopefully T cells, um, antiviral T cells that are uh, surveilling the tissue and the tumor will be able to engage the T cell as foreign. And, and we like this approach of having two mechanisms of action. One, because it gives us the, the opportunity to deplete as many of these targets as we can through our primary mechanism of action, uh, but also an opportunity in cases where we have too low receptor expression or we need to expand the breadth of the response to deliver this antigen response and hopefully seed um, further T cell innervation into the tumor. So one big question we had initiating this program is, you know, how do we target this approach, both from the level of the tumor target, um, as well as the level of the antigen peptide? So I'll start talking through a little bit about the, the tumor target itself. And, you know, here what we see is that uh, we wanted a solid tumor uh, profile and we wanted something that was, you know, hopefully clinically validated. Um, to help us with our best shot at, at success with this particular molecule. And so PDL1 came out as our potential lead for this, as um, in the immune checkpoint inhibitor space, it has been validated as a target with atezolizumab and dravalumab, um, as well as avalumab. Um, you see a positive response in solid tumors. There, there still, unfortunately, is still unmet need, even though the immune checkpoints have been a breakthrough in terms of um, immunotherapy, there is the potential that not all patients will respond to this therapy. Uh, there's a potential for resistance to occur. And for the most part, we need a strong immune and T cell intervention into the tumor to drive this response as sort of a, a hot tumor microenvironment. So where ETBs may be um, helpful in this case is the ability to directly target the PDL1 on the tumor cells. So even in the absence of immune responses, we have the potential to deplete the PDL1 positive tumor cells. Uh, we know that under levels of inflammation will induce PD-L1 expression. There's nice literature around immunosuppressive cells and importantly monocytic populations um, that are in the tumor microenvironment. And we think that we can target them as well. And this may be uh, in addition to checkpoint inhibition um, by depleting these cells, uh, one other way to restore dysfunctional uh, or functional immunity to the tumor microenvironment. And then finally delivering the antigen um, to redirect these T cell responses for maximum, uh, maximizing depletion, but also maybe to overcome some of the resistance. In terms of the antigenic peptide, um, uh, these data over here are looking at antiviral T cells, and, and Kelly did a nice job of showing it with, with the TCR uh, single cell sequencing, how uh, a variety of antigen-specific antiviral T cells can actually be in the tumor. And we, we looked at CMV and EBV and, and flu 
uh, restricted T cells um, for this reason, and also for the fact that you can pull these T cells out of the tumor microenvironment, re-stimulate them, and they can drive a nice functional fit T cell response. So we went through a process of evaluating various peptides, uh, looked at the IEDB and, and picked our kind of best choices. We landed on an approach to, to start with HLA-A2 specific and, and for that reason, picking a very highly immunodominant CTL population from uh, the cytomegalovirus PP65 protein. So this NLVP peptide that uh, uh, the T cells here are clearly HLA2 restricted. Um, CMV is a nice virus for our particular um, responses because 60 to 80 percent of individuals have been exposed to CMV. They have a pretty strong effector memory profile, and so they're ready to go within the tissue um, as soon as antigen gets delivered. And again, they're found in the tissue ready to go. So that was our general approach. Um, the next step was sort of building out the particular platform for us with our, with our um, engineered toxin bodies. And we wanted to build out a set of molecules to allow us to really investigate the mechanism of action. So we built ourselves out a toolkit with proof of concept uh, binding domains onto our, our platform. Our molecule that we, we wanted to move into development with both the ribosome inhibition MOA1 and then the antigen CD MOA2 as our main sort of molecule. Uh, but then a parental molecule in which we didn't include the peptide, so we could benchmark back against the response in the absence of antigen seeding. And then fortunately identified two point mutations in the sugar like toxin itself that didn't affect its binding or routing properties, but did shut down the enzymatic activity of the ribosome inhibition. So now this is a really nice molecule to actually look at the antigen seeding response and antigenic delivery in the absence of any um, ribosome inhibition. So some of the first set of experiments we did with these proof of concept molecules was just treat tumor targets that were either pd one positive, negative, or HLA positive or negative with our ETBs. I'm showing here a pd one positive and HLA positive target cell um, in the absence of ETB and in the presence of ETB um, using a, a reagent that is able to detect MHC, uh, the peptide in the context of MHC on the surface of targets. And so we can see um, these cells start to express the antigen over time. Um, at early time points, we don't see much, but over time we see this uh, expression is uh, in line with the, the kinetics of our ETB internalizing and delivering that antigen. So this was our first real nice kind of proof of concept that we could seed the antigenic response. Um, we deliver it to the surface. And so the next aspects were really building out um, a series of models to, to demonstrate T cell functionality and the ability to drive this response further. Um, so now, now my turn to, to sort of, of course, plug Proimmune because you've been our go-to for all of our um, pentamer responses. And I'm showing you our CMV PP65, which is the Pro5 pentamer uh, um, evaluation of our target cells here. But, but we've looked at multiple um, different sort of antigen peptides with, with these reagents um, to great success. So we, we screened multiple donors um, to look for CMV positivity. In general, we could see between 1% and 5% antigen-specific CD8 T cells in these donors. Uh, we built out a really nice protocol to expand and enrich these T cells in house. And so you can go from that small percentage to, um, you know, between 50 and 75% of the CD8s ex uh, expressing that um, specific TCR. And the majority of these cells uh, almost uniformly are effector memory cells ready to engage target and elicit response. So once we had this model in place, we then developed a co-cultural model with various tumor targets with the right HLA or peptide combination and controls. Here I'm just showing in blue uh, exogenous peptide loading or an orange exogenous peptide loading, either with our, our um, pentamer cells straight out of blood at the low frequency or uh, under the rich protocol. So we can see in a, in a T cell killing assay here that um, peptide can drive this response. It requires a lot of T cells, of course, when we have low frequency. Uh, but as we enrich them, we can shift that curve to the left and get a real nice response. Um, what was really nice for us to see early on in this project was that we could take different binding domain derived ETBs targeted in pd one and we could actually drive this response uh, predictably similar to what we see with the exogenous peptide loading with our, with our ETBs. So the start of our real uh, validation of the model. Um, as I sort of alluded to on the previous slide, we've been able to expand the T cell um, and, and antigen seeding profile across antigens. Um, I'm just showing the T cell responses here, but this is a variety of antigens that we tested, um, seeing very nice again with the premium pentamers, uh, effector memory populations that we think make sense for our particular platform, and then nice enriched populations of T cells. So a potential opportunity for, for down the road um, beyond what we're doing with CMV PP65. 
Uh, to really hash out the model a little bit further, we built a co-culture model and I'm showing live cell imaging here using our molecule that has the inactivated ribosome and just delivering an antigen. Uh, in green are T cells and they're co-cultured with tumor targets. So in the absence of VTB, you see those T cells engage the targets um, for short periods of time, but then they, they sort of go away. When we're delivering that antigen, what we found was that these T cells cluster nicely, they engage with their targets and they stay over time which is uh, shown in this graph down here, this prolongation of interaction with targets. And it's consequential as we see these T cells secrete interfering gamma in an antigen dependent manner and target dependent manner, and also eliminate the, the tumor targets in an antigen dependent manner. So again, this is, this is a demonstration of our antigen seeding technology and demonstration that you can redirect uh, CMV specific CTLs to tumor targets through this pd one targeting approach. Uh, we, we further built that out to now incorporate the molecule that which was of interest to us that incorporates both uh, of the mechanisms of action. And so if we look at the kinetic response again, what we can see here is that um, over time our tumor cells grow, the T cells by themselves don't really show a response and an inactive molecule and the absence of T cells also don't show a response. When we give our MOA1 molecule only, we can kill these tumor targets. And when we give our MOA2 molecule only with antigen seeding in the presence of T cells, we also do this response. But um, towards our goal of how we try to engineer this, when we have a functional molecule with both antigen seeding and ribosome inhibition, we really deplete those tumors um, fully in this in vitro model. And this activity is driven through the direct cell kill, but also only in the context of antigen do we see this, this activation. So a really nice demonstration of two modalities um, driving distinct responses to lead to an additive benefit in targeting the tumors. So I'll just finish out with the next last few slides here talking about our lead molecule for development this year, MT6402. And it's pdl one targeted and I'll walk you through some of the, the, the sort of evaluation of this molecule. So MT6402 um, shows a really nice in vitro specificity and efficacy profile uh, against tumor cells. So on the top we're showing pdl one positive uh, high mid and negative cells and we show the binding of the molecule in a, in a nice um, pdl one dependent manner. And also the kill of the tumor targets through ribosome ambition follows the same suit of pdl one expression. We've moved into several um, in vivo models here. I'm just showing a non-small cell lung PDX model in which we show 642 is capable of depleting tumor cells and, and leading to prolonged survival and reduced tumor burden over time in, in the animals. So a very nice targeted and potent depletion profile uh, in vitro and in vivo. One thing that I mentioned a little bit earlier, but I'll go into just a little more detail here, is that uh, we have the potential to deplete immune cells as well. And this, this we think is a benefit, but could also be a challenge in terms of toxicity. Um, so we evaluated peripheral blood um, populations of cells, and we did it in the presence or absence of interf interfering gamma to provide an inflammatory signal. Um, and that was really kind of to understand um, you know, peripherally where we don't see inflammation, will we be safe? And then in, in tissues like tumors where we expect to have inflammation, will we have the potential to drive a response? And so on the top, we see monocytes and on the bottom, we see lymphocytes. If we treat with interfering gamma, we can induce a higher pdl one expression on monocytes. We, we don't see much on the lymphocytes and that tracks with the ability of MT6402 to, to um, start to deplete those monocyte populations in a pdl one dependent manner. So again, for us, the, this speaks to the ability to selectively deplete immune cells. And we really think that's gonna only happen in the context of inflammation in the, in the tumor cell as a potential benefit. The antigen seeding uh, response with MT6402 is comparable to what I showed you before. Again, a similar kinetic response here in which each individual MOA behaves um, in its ability to target the cells, but it's really a 6402 with both uh, and mechanisms in play that drives the strongest response. This is a really nice dose dependent response here in the model and a really nice dose dependent interfering gamma secretion. So really um, a nice ability for the molecule to selectively deliver antigen, drive cell kill and drive T cell activation. So I'll just finish off with just the last bit of in vivo profiling in non-human primate model with a weekly dosing model here. Our molecules are under 100 kilodalton, so they have a very short half Life, which is good being an immunotoxin to uh, potentially tune and limit the tox. Um, but uh, despite that, these are two different doses of, of 64.2 and the inactive variant um, show really nice PK profiling. Um, but the doses that we're seeing are covering our potency both for um, tumor cells as well as immune cells. Um, here's our two 
two doses here, and here's the, the predicted uh, efficacy from our in vitro modeling. So we think we're in a good position to cover the responses we need to cover at doses that will be in our first in human. Um, we've also seen nice PD responses, harkening back to our in vitro data here, depletion in a dose-dependent manner with our active molecule of uh, pd one positive monocytes that doesn't happen in, in the inactive molecule, so it really requires the, the active activity. And then again, a subsequent PD marker expansion of T cell responses, which is in line with some of the data shown previously around immune checkpoint inhibitors and expansion of, of particular T cell subsets that may be associated with depletion of PD-L1 um, in, in the animals. So I'll just finish out with a model here for the, the approach. We think you know, we have a really unique approach for delivering um, a holistic targeting of the tumor through direct depletion of tumor cells to reduce tumor burden, uh, potentially to eliminate suppressive immune cells that express pd one in the tumor microenvironment to restore a more functional response and allow for um, our mechanism of altering the immunophenotype through antigen seeding and delivering of antigen to recruit T cell responses to the tumor as an additional mechanism um, to drive tumor. So with that, um, I just really you know like to thank everybody involved in the work. Uh, I've listed the, the members of molecular templates that really drove key responses. In particular, my immunology team um, have really done a great job driving uh, this molecule into the clinic and really doing a good job around the antigen seeding. And um, thank you again to Emily and Promune for the opportunity and uh, the support through, through uh, a lot of the things that we do here. So with that, thank you very much again, and I'm happy to take any questions. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Larry. That's a great talk. Um, so we do have some questions for you. Um, first, I'm going to hand over to Amy Rosenberg. Amy's got a question for you. I'll just unmute you, Amy. Yes. So, um, so uh, the, uh, my question has to do with the antigen uh, delivery. So tumors are very clever in downregulating MHC. Um, what uh, approach might you have to dealing with tumors that have low expression of MHC? Um, can they be epigenetically modified to re-express higher levels, offering a better site for CTL? Yeah, that's a really great question. And, you know, we're trying to do in our first approach here is, is target tumors where we think that that isn't going to be a major mechanism of tumor escape. Um, it's a really, we, we've talked a lot about it about this approach um, in, in maybe in combination approaches to, you know, many of the tumors will lose some of the MHC expression, um, not because they don't have MHC or beta 2, but because they've lost responsiveness to interferon gamma or antigen processing. So we're looking into ways to think about how we could modulate the immune environment in addition to delivering the antigen. Um, you know, we think we have a unique opportunity here by targeting pd one where there's been validated responses here with the checkpoint inhibitors, but, but going forward, those are um, opportunities that we're actively trying to understand better. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Larry, for that. 